Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I welcome you to St. Andrew's United Methodist Church, Virginia Beach. I hope you've had a great week. Uh, today is the what we call the, the first Sunday uh, after Epiphany, or Baptism of the Lord Day. We're going to talk about baptism and what it means to us individually and corporately a little bit. Um, as I say, I hope you've had a good week. It's been a very, very interesting week. Um, some rather crazy things taking place. I hope you've been safe. hope you're taking care of your neighbors, your family. hope you're continuing to be safe yourself. Um, things seem to be getting rather serious, and uh, we have the new strain of the virus that's apparently now working its way through the United States, which means that it's a great deal more... Um, it's easier to catch than it was. And so, please be careful, be safe. Glad you came to worship. Why don't we take a couple moments before we begin our... Well, let me say this to you. that uh, Thank you for last year and what you did for uh, the ministries of St. Andrews. It was a wonderful year. Um, we helped so many people. It was absolutely incredible. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, if you'd like to make donations to the church, uh, you have three different possibilities. You can um, go on the website and make a donation. You can mail it in to 717 Tucson Road, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23462. Or you can drive it by the church. There's a black box, a depository box, up by the main door, and you can stick it there. We're going to continue to not have uh, services um, in person for a period of time because the numbers have simply gotten extremely high around us, as I'm sure you know. So, let us uh, take a couple moments to center ourselves on Christ as we begin our worship of Jesus. Let us pray. Amen. Our call to worship. Today we celebrate a special baptism, the baptism of Jesus of Nazareth. God says, look, my chosen servant, the one whom, in whom I utterly delight, I have placed my spirit upon him. He will bring true justice to the nations. It's reported when Jesus was baptized that the heavens opened and the spirit came down like a dove and there was a voice from heaven saying, this is my dearly loved Son, with whom I am delighted. May the joy of the Lord be with you all this morning. Amen. Let us pray. Most wonderful God, foolish and flawed though we are, we too delight in your beloved Son. In his name we gather in your house, in our homes, to, to praise you. May the heavens be open to us, that we may catch a glimpse of the light and the love that transforms our common days with beauty. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Here now are reading the Holy Scriptures of Mark chapter 1, 14 through 11. We're going to be using the Voice Bible again. We're going to use it for a while. It has such an interesting tone and way of uh, expressing the Scriptures. The messenger was John the Baptist, who appeared in the desert near the Jordan River, preaching that the people should be ritually cleansed through baptism with water as a sign of both a changed heart and God's forgiveness of their sins. People from all across the countryside of Judea and from the city of Jerusalem came to him and confessed that they were deeply flawed and in need of help. So he cleansed them with waters, the Jordan. John, dre John dressed as some of the ancient Hebrew prophets had in clothes made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and his meals were made from the desert locust and wild honey he preached a message in the wilderness John the Baptist 
said, Someone is coming who is a lot more powerful than I am, one whose sandals I'm not worthy to bend down and untie. I've washed you here through baptism with water, but he, when he gets here, will wash you with the Holy Spirit of God. Now the Jordan is the setting for some of the most memorable miracles in the Old Testament. On their journey through the wilderness to the Promised Land, the Israelites walked across the Jordan on dry land because God had parted its waters. Elisha, one of the prophets of God, healed by name, healed Naaman by telling him to bathe seven times in the waters. Partly because of the miracles like these, and partly because of a growing wilderness spirituality. Many of the Jews in John's day are out to hear and to ritually be baptized by, John, by Jordan's cool cleansing waters. They're looking for God to intervene miraculously in their lives as he has done in the past. What they don't know is that God is about to intervene for at that time, Jesus left Nazareth and head south. It was in those days that Jesus of Nazareth, a village in the region of Galilee, and came to Jordan. And John cleansed him through baptism there in the same way that all the others were ritually cleansed. But as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he looked up and saw the sky split open. The Spirit of God descended on him like a dove, and a voice echoed in heavens. You are my son, my beloved one, and I am pleased with you. The written word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Sermon title was Let the Living Waters Renew Us. Let us pray. Lord, open us to hear from you this morning a word that each of us needs, particular to our needs. Speak it to us in a way that we can receive it. And help us to walk out what intentions you have for our life and for your kingdom through our receiving it. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Well, Christmas has ended. Twelve days. Ended on Epiphany. What an interesting day Epiphany was, huh? And, um, well, the, the, the camels, the wise men, have headed back to their country another way, a different way. They didn't go back to see Herod, uh, which has really irritated him. Um, Mary and Joseph and the baby have gathered themselves up, and they've headed down for Egypt. And uh, Herod has gone in and done the dastardly deed that he did in Bethlehem. And here we now jump from a baby being born all the way to a 30-year-old child. We're, we're jumping across one of the stories, the only story that we have about Jesus other than this, uh, where he goes to the temple. And I absolutely love that particular story. Um, but we're not going to touch it now. We're jumping to his being 30 because this is Baptism of the Lord Sunday, or what we call the first Sunday after Epiphany. Baptism of the Lord is where we celebrate Jesus being baptized. Now I have to tell you that I think in order to understand any scripture inside the Bible, there are several things that you need to understand other than just reading the words. Uh, even that could take us a month to talk about. But um, I do think that you need to understand the ethos of the location. What's taken place inside of that location before that offers a better development of the story that you're now reading. Um, the players, who are they, where did they come from, what kind of a history do they have. Um, all the different pieces of the story, if we can better understand these individual things, then we can better understand exactly what's going on and uh, it will have great depth for us. This location that the story takes place, this, um, this little teeny piece of water. You know, when I was a kid, I remember singing the song, Jordan River is wide and deep, wide and deep. It's neither wide nor deep. It's a creek at best. Uh, some folks have asked me, was there more water at other times of history? 
and chances are there were some more waters that, that poured through that at one point and certainly because of irrigation irrigation and things it uh, it has less but there is no indication that it was ever anything other than a small little teeny river that went through there there are two locations that are presented to us today if you go to Israel you'll find that there's a northern location and that's a beautiful location with trees and it's just it's lovely um, I don't believe that's the location where Jesus was baptized. The southern location is not so pretty. It's kind of reeds and it's flat and it's it's more like a water running through a piece of a desert. And uh, this is the location that I believe it probably took place. And the significance of that location is really, really important. I read for you the call to worship that, that came from... Um, McPhee's uh, information this week and f absolutely for sure this is the closest location to Jerusalem um, and this location is um, it's just north of the Dead Sea if you follow the Jordan up to the top you have the Galilee and that's the other location but this one is just north of the Dead Sea and it happens also to be about the location, if not the same exact location, where when the Israelites came up and they sent spies in to go and take a look when they were going to go into Israel and they came back and said, no doubt you remember, they said, you know, oh, these guys are giants. I don't think we should do this. And Moses said, okay, fine, let's take a hike. We'll be back. Forty years later, they show back up. And this time, Moses doesn't get to go in. They go in and they go into the city of Jericho. Jericho is right there at that little juncture north of the Dead Sea on the Jordan where they crossed. Now some of you may remember that they gathered up 12 stones, one you know as a remembrance of each of the 12 tribes and they piled them there. Naaman, this, this, this ruler, came to the, to the great religious guy, the great prophet, and the great prophet told him, go wash yourself seven times in the river. This would have been about the location. It's a crossing location for anybody who did traveling. Jesus, when he was a baby, inside of his mother's womb, probably crossed this river. Um, most of the folks from up north in, in Nazareth went across and down what would be the eastern side of the Jordan and then crossed back across at Jericho and then would use the old Jericho Road up to Jerusalem rather than going off to what would be the west through Samaria. Um, Jesus in his last day of his life uh, traveled down this same spot and crossed across at the same place where he was baptized going into into Jericho and and you know we have some of the great great stories about the ethos of Jericho the walls being torn down this place is a crossing place this this location at the river it's a it's a place where where new things are about to take place and obviously as Jesus is baptized new things are really about to transpire and to take place there are some um, there are some things that that are brought to to our attention in the midst of this story that create some problems for us. Um, some of our brothers and sisters of other faiths say that we have three gods. Uh, those of us that are Christian, most of us are Trinitarian, believing that there's Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer is more comfortable for some people some people to say, but this. This understanding that God is one, and in this particular moment, I, I'm going to talk about this in just a second. There, it's interesting to me that this is one of the locations where we have mention of all three, all three of the pieces of the Trinity present and taking an active role in what's going on. That for me is just really, really outstanding. We have four Gospels. And each of the four Gospels presents their story about Jesus' life a little bit different. Um, as I said uh, last week, a couple weeks ago, that doesn't create any angst for me that they tell the story differently. In fact, tells me that the story is actually truthful and honest. 
This is another one of the stories, as the bap, as the uh, birth of Jesus is, where the the stories are are told with some different aspects that take place. Um, the thing that seems to be overarching and exactly the same in all of them is that John is a part of this story. Jesus is being baptized, and God is being infused into this story. Let me talk about John the Baptist for a second. I believe that John was an Essene Jew. There are several different varieties of uh, sects in Jesus' day. Um, Pharisees, Sadducees, um, Zealots, Essenes. Essenes were, they were separatists. And they had a village in Qumran, which is just on the north side of the Dead Sea, not far away from where this took place. And so if John actually lived in Qumran or in the, the, the parts around Qumran, that village, then this would uh, make sense that, that he would do his ministry in this particular area. Um, John being in the scene would have left him with a particular kind of a theology and understanding of God and also of people, which would really lend itself to bringing some clarity as to why he barks at the religious guys when they come, because in his mind, they would not have the, uh, the things of God lined up in their mind and their actions the way that they should. Um, not unlike some of the things that we saw this week with with political issues in the United States, people having very different understandings about what it means to, to be a patriot. And there, inside of Jesus' day, very different understandings of what it meant to be a person of God. Um, and so, John is a very interesting guy. He's, he's really on the outside of normality of the day, and he's He's there in, in this, this wilderness kind of a place. It's difficult for me to, to get you to understand, except if you were to go into the desert and find a little stream running through it, and not far from there, an oasis town called Jericho, and there in that desert stream, which was a full mile below Jerusalem, and several miles to get back up to Jerusalem because you didn't walk straight up the hill, use the old Jericho Road. If you can imagine that, and imagine that people are pouring out of the towns, out of the Beths, Bethphage, Bethany, Bethlehem, out of Jerusalem, they're pouring out to go and see this guy in the midst of this wilderness. Then you have a sort of an understanding as to what's going on. This past week I was thinking about that. I was thinking, wow. Huh. And suddenly I saw on TV a line of cars wrapped around trying to get a vaccine. And I said to myself, oh my, there it is. There it is. A modern day understanding of the baptism. A modern day understanding of trying to seek salvation and lining up and trying to get vaccinated and to be saved. This, this baptism that John offered created some issues. Um, he was uh, reporting to do a baptism of repentance for remission of sins. Now, I don't have time to think about this with you today, but uh, people have written books about this. Uh, with our understanding of Trinitarian theology of Jesus being God and man fully and his being human in the world and the virgin birth, uh, being born of a, of a virgin, that all of these things begin to, to create some issues around his going and being baptized by John for a remission of sin and it's created some great angst uh, for folks um, and so we don't have time to talk about that but I'd love for you to think about that you may want to go and do some reading there's some great books out 
uh, on that subject and the Trinitarian theology that we believe in. And Jesus, Jesus comes and offers us some things that can't be offered to us in any other way. Folks have asked me over the years, is baptism a big deal? And my answer is, yeah, it's, it's a really big deal. Um, in, in these stories we have, uh, these, these different Gospels, they bring to us the baptism of Jesus. They've dealt, as I say, very uh, differently about, about how to deal with this message that John has. Uh, one of the writers has Jesus uh, baptizer John being put in prison before he's baptized that's his way of dealing with that issue that Mark brings up the other one has this comment about um, you know I'm not worthy to untie your sandals and Jesus saying hey we need to get this thing done but Jesus indicates that this is a very important thing for his followers to do and we in Methodism say that there are two two things that Jesus did that becomes something that he asked us to do and he participated in what we call sacraments one of them is communion and the other one is baptism now, baptism is that important for those of us who are Methodist uh, there's probably not a year that goes by that I don't have a conversation with somebody about about whether to baptize a child or not baptize a child whether to wait and do a believers baptism well, certainly this is everyone's right to choose how to do this, but I believe that infant baptism is the way to go. That as soon as a mother and father or, or a person who wants to present a child desires to present that child to the church for baptism, then I think we need to take care of it. The reason is, it's very simple. What happened to Jesus happens to us. Jesus upon being baptized by uh, John it says that the heavens were open and the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove as I said this is the only point that I can think of in the scriptures where we have all three being really marked out and having their own roles all three of the Trinitarian we have the Son being baptized we have the Spirit descending and and coming upon and in Jesus and we have the father speaking this is my son with whom I'm well pleased now I have yet to see a baptism where that happens where God says you know this is one of my children with whom I'm well pleased but it is my theological understanding that everyone who's baptized receives the Spirit of God inside of them and so the way that I answer parents as they ask me, would you baptize a child now or wait and allow them to make decision is, I say to them, would you like to have the Spirit of God on the inside of them, helping them to grow into a person of God and into a person that you'd be proud of to be a part of your family? And they invariably say yes. And I say, well, this is what, this is, what is offered by this ritual. Let me be clear. A presenter presents a person who is going to be baptized and that can either be the person itself if they're old enough or it can be a parent or a grandparent or, or whomever they present this and there is a covenantal relationship that then takes place between four entities the person that's being baptized one the presenters two the congregation community of faith three and God for there is a covenantal relationship being aligned and being started between these four entities will you raise this child inside the church and raise it and rear it and bring it into the presence of God on a regular basis so that it will grow up and take on for itself its own confirmation of its faith will you the congregation will you help this person to raise this child, this person, to become a person involved in the community of faith. And then God promising something for us, and what God promises for us is 
It promises to, to come in the Spirit and reside in and with us. This is an incredibly powerful thing. Uh, the prevenient grace of God chases after us all the time from we're created on. But after baptism, the Spirit of God then resides inside of us as well as around us and can begin to work on the inside of us. I've said before in a joking way, but it's really not joking for me either. It's, it's quite serious. Uh, I have my, my, my children baptized, one by a district superintendent and one by a bishop. The one by a bishop didn't hold all that well. The one by a uh, district superintendent was far better. If I had a third child, I think I would go to a licensed local pastor. All kidding, just, just kidding. But honestly, my hope and my prayer presenting my children to be baptized was that the Spirit of God would reside inside of them and there would not be a Sunday morning where they would awake. Oh, wow. What a sneeze. There would not be a Sunday morning that they would awake and not think about church. That there would not be a day that they would wake up in the morning and not think about love, that God loved them. I wanted the Spirit of God to reside inside of them so that they had for themselves a really personal relationship with God. Even if they did not choose to activate further any more of the relationship, you cannot take away the gift of baptism from somebody. You can choose to walk away from God, but you can't choose to get away from God. Because God's proveniently around you and also inside of you with baptism. And so I think it's a really, really important thing for us to do for our children. I, I think that it's really important for us inside of our families to understand that, that it's important. And inside of our churches, we need to understand that those that have been baptized and where the church has made that covenantal relationship um, statement, we need to take seriously how we treat those children as they grow up into young adults and adults. Today, um, I'm going to ask you to do something that, that's kind of strange. I'd like for you to take a basin of water at some point today, uh, and I'd like for you to just take some water and to allow it to pour over your hands. And I'd like to rem you to remember your baptism and to be thankful. If there's anything that I hope for you, it's that you will be growing into your baptism. That through the power of God, the residing presence of God in you and with you, that you will be moving into regenerating yourself and being regenerated by God into the person that God desires you to be in this world and so that you will be in ministry as God desires you to be in this world. You'll be calling people to God and not pushing them away from God. A buddy of mine this past week, he said every time he takes a shower, he remembers his baptism. And I thought, Wow, I need to do that every morning. I need to remember my baptism. You need to remember your baptism. I say to you, God loves you beyond your wildest imagination. God at your baptism came and, and placed God's self inside of you. God wants to know you better as you know him better. God wants you to grow into the person that God intended you to be. Go this week into the world and be people of God who are being better at being God's people. Amen? Amen. Would you join me in prayer for the folks around us that are hurting? Let us pray for a couple seconds for, for the people around us. Amen. Let us pray for those. Uh, let us pray for our government and, and those that are that are in control of our government as they're they're trying to to rule. Let us pray for them. Amen. Let us pray for our church and its leadership. Amen. 
let's pray for all the folks that that have been severely affected by this disease and increasingly so uh, people that are caring for us and doctors and and the folks that are administering the vaccine that they can get it out quickly let us pray for that situation in those individuals Lord God, and direct our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. Come and speak to us. Allow us to hear you. Continue to mold us into the people that you would have us to be. Help us to desire to allow you to do that to us. Help us to be corporately the folks that, that you want us to be. Help us, Jesus, to remember your baptism. In your holy name, would you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. May your week be filled with much love. May the Spirit of God show God's self to you. May you remember your baptism and live into it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may it be so. Amen.